I'm the best there is at what I do, and what I do is talk toys in the form of action figure evolution, where I trace the various action figure incarnations of one particular character throughout the years. In this instance, it's Wolverine, of course. If you missed part one, click this annotation to catch up on the early years, then be straight back as... In the year 2000, the X-Men went Hollywood. With the X-Men movie, it breathed new life into the characters, and X-Men action figures filled toy shelves in a way they hadn't done for quite a few years. The movie action figures followed the X-Men Onslaught series flirtation with six-inch scale. Scale Toy Biz more or less settled on for their remaining run with the Marvel action figure license. With Hugh Jackman cast as Wolverine, a star would be born, yet the character was already the star of the X-Men movie merchandising, receiving six action figures. In comparison, Halle Berry Storm got one. One too many, some might say. What? So here we have Wolverine in his uniform from the movie. At the time, Marvel must have been over the moon that one of their properties was hitting the big screen in live action, as boy did they splash the actors' likenesses and names all over the packaging, which did the figure somewhat of a disservice as the likenesses in the sculpting just wasn't there. Now, did I mention that the likeness just wasn't there? <laughs> That's not entirely fair with this one. It came in a two-pack with a saber tooth. It features a mechanism in the head to make him snarl, growl, and roar. Alas, the rubber hasn't aged well, so now he just oddly pulses in the forehead and pleads with you to end his life. Kill me. Then the Wolverine that came in a two-pack with Rogue came dressed in his street clothes, a shirt and jeans. Jeans and features claw strike action, which is a fancy way of saying he can stab Rogue, puncturing major organs, likely severing her spine with his claws, then piercing out her back. And if that's how you treat your friends, I'd hate to be your enemy. And really, six Wolverine movie figures was probably four or five too many. As we saw in part one back in the 90s, Toy Biz were drawing on 30 years of comic history, during which Wolverine had gone through many distinct changes on which figures could be based, but the movie figures were based on a mere 90 minute story, so the difference between Wolverine not wearing a jacket and wearing a jacket hardly gave anybody the fever to collect them all. Distinction came in the form of play features and accessories, so for this one we squeeze his legs for pop-up claw slashing action. That action feature isn't really breaking ground in the big scheme of Wolverine action figures, but his accessory offered something a bit more new. It's an x-ray machine, which we place Wolverine behind and press the button to reveal his adamantium skeleton. Kinda nifty, isn't it? Well, at least Burger King felt if it was good enough for people to slam down money to buy, then they'd love it for free with a Whopper and fries in the form of this kid's club meal toy. So while they certainly do not hold up to many a modern action figure, in many ways I consider the X-Men movie figures as transitional, bridging the gap between the 90s and what we today would consider modern action figures. No doubt with in mind the big spotlight a major motion picture can cast, the year 2000 also gave us a second X-Men animated series. Known as X-Men Evolution, it would run for four seasons, so must have been popular, just not really with me. It's reimagining of the X-Men X-Men lore never sat well with me, and perhaps the memory of the more comic purist Fox animated series was still too fresh in my mind. That said, I did admire the animation style. It seemed much more considered and less rushed than the 90s cartoon. And when it comes to Wolverine's redesign, I guess they knew better not to mess with one of the most recognisable aspects of the franchise. So he got off light with an orange and black colour scheme and some strappy boots. Here in the Battle Ravage version, we see that costume has been torn up, he has a bunch of bloody scratch marks, and half of his mask has been ripped away. Now you can't not have noticed those buttons on his back, the right one is for his double claw slashing action. Hmm. It's less claw slashing action and more slight shuddering tremble, so it's no wonder Wolverine's had the crap beaten out of him here. Very disappointing, especially when we consider the card back where we get an illustration of a big swoosh of a claw slash. Let's check the other button for his kicking action. Well, that works pretty decent. Here is his opponent, the Sabretooth accessory he comes with. And with Sabretooth's left leg still in the sewer or whatever it is he's climbing out of, it literally renders him a one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest.
Our next action figure revisits a well first visited in part one, it's Ninja Wolverine. With cartoons and ninjas long being a match made in heaven. And in the comics with Wolverine mastering various forms of martial arts during his time in Japan, it doesn't seem that big a stretch. And so outfitted in a karate gi, he is ready to keep his fighting skills on point using this training dummy. So like the Battle Ravage figure, this one also has buttons on his back to strike the dummy's stomach for arm popping action. And that accessory makes our next figure look like the poor cousin of the X-Men Evolution toy line as he comes with just a cowboy hat? Yeehaw! He doesn't even have his claws popped. I guess the day this one was conceived of at Toy Biz, imagination was on holiday and value for money called in sick. Rounding out X-Men Evolution, here's an unmasked Wolverine figure which came with his motorcycle. As Wolverine's preferred mode of transport, it wasn't the first figure to come with his bike, and stay tuned as it sure won't be his last. In my opinion, the success of the first X-Men movie played a really important part in getting the ball rolling on the comic book movie genre as a whole that still hasn't peaked even to this day, yet the success of the X-Men movie action figures is a lot more debatable. I picked mine up before the movie came out from speciality stores, paying over the odds. They later showed up everywhere in big volumes, and much later ended up being heavily discounted, selling at a fraction of the price I first paid for them. I think that's down to the tone of the movie, what with it kicking off, a Nazi concentration camp. It's hardly kiddie friendly, is it? Plus being in live action, the producers made a definite attempt to decamp the costumes and make them more real world applicable. So gone were the bright, colorful costumes from the cartoons and comics that caught kids' attention. So by the time X-Men 2 rolled around, the accompanying figures were very scaled back. For instance, Halle Berry's Storm got zero, and although based on her performance, she might deserve zero. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not pick on her unnecessarily as characters like Rogue, Professor X, Jean and Mystique were also without figures this time around. Wolverine endured though receiving four figures split over two series. Ultimately I feel the X-Men 2 figures suffered as the first ones did. I mean try as Toy Biz might to spice them up with action verbs like Battle Attack Logan there on the left and Street Fight Logan on the right. In reality though Leather Jacket Logan and Dirty Wife Beta Vest Logan don't make for the most eye-catching figures and likely got lost in the shuffle on toy store shelves. But let's not entirely undermine them. Compared to their counterparts from the first movie line, then it's clearly evident that while just a few years passed between the first and second X-Men movies, those few years meant a giant leap for action figures. We see that in the sculpt with the likeness. Still not a dead ringer, I admit, but certainly a vast improvement. Yet I have to say it's an odd state of affairs when a wind-up toy receives a better sculpted likeness than any of these action figures. But for me, where this leap was most remarkable was in the articulation. Here we see a shift with these action figures being sold, not on play feature gimmicks, but purely on superposability, with packaging trumpeting as many as 29 points of articulation. Now keep in mind, in the previous part, the first Wolverine figure from 1984 only had five points of articulation. And in the 16 years that passed between that one and the year 2000, when the first X-Men movie was released, the movie Wolverine figure still only graduated to 12 points of articulation, meaning between the first and second X-Men movies the points of articulation had more than doubled. That translates, for example, as the first X-Men movie Wolverine just has a head rotation at the neck, whereas the X-Men 2 Wolverine rotates, moves down and up, plus some side-to-side -side movement. So articulation like double-jointed elbows and knees and much more meant we could pose action figures like never before, and for we collectors displaying action figures was becoming art. Why this sudden leap, you ask? Well, in 2002, the year before X-Men 2 was released, Toy Biz debuted the Marvel Legends line, which pioneered superposability. Toy Biz's Marvel Legends would have long-lasting effects for the culture of action figure collecting, and it's that era that Wolverine's adamantium claws will be cutting into in the next part, so stay tuned for that. Compiling these evolution videos incur considerable time and expense, so I'd appreciate it if you could recognize my efforts by giving this 
video a big thumbs up and to make sure videos like this keep on coming share with your friends on your social media of choice. Click the video on the right for more action figure evolution this time featuring the rhino. Subscribe for more and I hope to see you next time. Mm, bye.